Good morning. I'm so glad you're joining me today. And uh, my name is Jim Nichols. I'm the senior pastor here at Southern Hills. And if this is your first time joining us, well, first, let me tell you, I'm glad you're here. And second, I probably need to explain some things. And even if you are regularly with us, you probably have some questions this morning. Well, let me try and bring you up to speed just a little bit. Uh, at some point, we knew that the, the hands of COVID would wrap their hands around our church, and this week we got just a small taste of that. One of our staff members tested positive, and this staff member is, was as shocked as we all were. See, masks and washing and hand sanitizer and social distancing have been all of our norms for all of us, including the staff member. Now, tracing in their family and other places has really led to dead ends. We have no idea how the pandemic was passed along to her. And this staff member has been isolating since early in the week. And even before they were tested, they were staying uh, away. And on Wednesday, we learned of this positive result. And I decided that out of an abundance of caution, that all of our church staff would be tested and isolated until we received the negative results. Joy and I were tested on Thursday morning, and I'm recording today's broadcast on Friday afternoon. But we're still anticipating our results, uh, that they're going to come by the end of the day. And we are expecting negative results. We feel really great. Many, most of our staff members have already received negative results. And I've never been so happy to be surrounded by negative people. We felt it best until we got this information to move all of today's worship service to an online offering and to keep everyone isolated until we are confident in everyone's safety. So this morning, uh, we're going to be a, a little bit different than our usual Sunday mornings. I'm going to share a time of prayer with you. Our we're going to have our scripture reading. I'm going to share my sermon, some final thoughts. And sadly, we will miss Joan and James and our ensemble and our music, but fear not, we'll be back soon. So I invite you, let's, uh, let's grab our candles, let's settle in, let's give our attention to God, let's lift up our prayers and our hearts to the Lord. And as the opening video shared, let us be reminded of the God who is with us, even when everything feels upside down. Let's start this morning with a tune that might just help us come to a time of prayer. As we come to a time of prayer this morning, I want to share a blessing, a word of blessing, if you will. If you didn't know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and today is Pastor Appreciation Day. Now, if you haven't heard about that until right this moment, that's okay. It's a little weird for pastors to talk about. It kind of sounds self-serving. But I hope you'll allow me a moment of personal privilege. Throughout this month, I've been taking time on my Facebook page to celebrate and thank the pastors in my life, men and women, who have made and are still making a huge difference in my life. Well, today on Pastor's Appreciation Sunday, I want to offer my appreciation to you, to this church and all the churches I have been blessed to serve and to love from Alabama, Florida, and now four churches here in Kentucky, Christ Church in Louisville, Lancaster, First at Andover, and here at Southern Hills, you all are what I am thankful for. Y'all have blessed me beyond my wildest imagination. To you all here at Southern Hills, Thank you for this first year, for your acceptance and welcome of me and my family. Even with the global pandemic, you've poured out tremendous grace upon me, and I am thankful for you deeply. So from your pastor, I appreciate you. You are a blessing to me, and I love you all dearly. 
The song we just listened to is a hymn we explored this past summer. But its words give me hope this morning. I love this song. I love the beauty and I love the simple ask, be thou my vision. There's much we have to be thankful for. And today we'll talk about a vision that's pretty stunning. So I invite you <clears throat> this morning to pray with me, to seek vision, to let the great God of heaven offer peace and wholeness and healing and provision and love to us all. Would you pray with me? The Lord be with you and with your spirit. King of my heart, best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, our light, our wisdom, our true word, high King of heaven, our treasure. May we reach heaven's joys, heart of our own heart, whatever befall, still be our vision, a ruler of all. Lord Jesus, we come this morning with mixed emotions. It's not a normal morning. Of course it's not. It's not been normal for a long time. I know I'm tired of the mess. I'm tired of the uncertainty and the fear. I think we all are. We are once again coming to you and asking for your intervention. We are asking for your healing and for a touch that can only come from you. So gracious God, come and be with us. I want to thank you for this church and for what it means to me, but more importantly, what it, what it, what this family means to you. Father, for 61 years, you have been at work. You have guided and guarded here at Southern Hills. You have released us on mission and you have given us a mission field. I thank you for the legacy. I thank you for the heart and the ministry here. I thank you for the lives and the kingdom that is being advanced ever since day one because of this place and these people. This morning, we seek your touch, your presence in the lives of this family. Lord, some of us are in need of provision. We're at the end of our rope. Would you rescue us? Some of us are sick. Our bodies are frail and hurting. Would you be our healer? Some of us have minds and hearts that are tired and sad and feel deeply burdened. Would you comfort us? Would you shower us once more with your grace, with the grace of your presence and your love? God, we're all in need of your touch and a word from you. So thank you for your promise to meet and to be with us. Abba, I ask that in those places where we have failed, where we have rooms that we have not let you in, would you invite us to confession and repentance? Bring to mind even now where you want to free us from shackles and chains of our sin. Forgive us, free us and release us to live wide open for you. God, I thank you for this technology that allows us to connect this morning as spread apart as we are. Pour out your spirit on all of us and unite our hearts and voices even now as we pray together as Jesus taught us so long ago saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading this morning, read by our very own and Transylvania freshman Katie Walsh, is a longer passage that shares the holy and final moments of Moses. We've looked at his life throughout this series, and that continues today. Continues today. As always, I want to invite you to respond after Katie says the word of God for the people of God in gratitude to the living word by saying, thanks be to God. Let's turn our attention now to the reading of God's word. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. Then Moses went up to Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab and climbed Saiga Peak, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead as far as Dan, all the land of Nephalti, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah extending to the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the Jordan Valley with Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zor. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter the land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear and he was as strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over. 
Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For 40 years, Moses led the former Hebrew slaves through the wilderness uh, with the promised land as their destination. I heard a colleague say recently that they would have gotten there a whole lot faster had Moses been a woman. She would have asked for directions. Of course, over those 40 years, there was a lot that poor Moses had to endure. The people whined and they complained to nonstop. Oh, they would follow, but then they would turn bitter and they'd start to grumble. Moses would intercede, God would provide, and things would appear for a while to be pretty calm. Those recesses, though, they were short, they lived, and, and one of them was the straw that, that broke old Mo's back. The story's found in Numbers 20, and the people do what they do. They just complained. Moses' sister, Miriam, the matriarch of the family of the people, she had died and she had been buried. And as the final shovel of dirt is being placed, they start to argue with Moses. There's no water. And their words, they had to have been like knives. Did you bring us out here for us to die too, Moses? Well, even in their grief, Moses and Aaron, they bow their faces to the Lord and, and God gives clear instructions. Speak to the rock and water will flow. Simple, concise, no big show. Just speak and watch. Well, Moses walks to the rock and instead of just doing the simple instructions, Moses' frustration just bubbles out. Listen to me, you rebellious and whiny people. Do you want us to bring water out of this rock? Moses strikes the rock and water starts to flow. Can you feel Moses reaching his limit, the whining, the complaining, the desert life? It had finally taken him to a place where he couldn't see anything but just frustration. And instead of pointing the people to God, simple obedience, Moses puts himself right up on the same level as God. And Moses, on purpose or an accident, claimed an equality and an ability to provide alongside with God. And, and, and if the complaining was the, the breaking point for Moses, then this threshold is, is a place that God can't allow Moses to cross over. Moses was told that because of his choice, he would not be allowed to enter the land of promise. He would not step on the land of freedom, but would die just with it out of grasp. There's a lot in the story that's hard to, to hold on to. As a leader, it's, it's kind of terrifying. Have, have I assumed actions and words that weren't of God? Have, have I led on my own merits, claimed God's hand? Have any of us had a moment when we presented ourselves in a light that, that wasn't true? Moses died in that foreign land of Moab. His body wasn't entombed or enshrined. God took his servant home and Joshua was called to step in and lead. The scriptures say that the people mourned Moses, but they also accepted Joshua as their leader, promising to obey Joshua as they had Moses. Now that doesn't sound like good news to me. Maybe they might want to up their game a little bit, obeying a little differently. Well, next week, we're going to end this series with what Joshua does next, how he would uh, begin leading the people. But today, I want to reflect on this moment of Moses on the top of Mount Nebo. It's an anticlimactic ending to such a phenomenal life. He, he climbed a peak. He sat down. He saw what had been promised for hundreds of years to the patriarchs. And instead of possessing it, he saw it and he died. My goodness, it doesn't seem fair. But life is kind of like that, isn't it? Do we ever really possess what it is of God's to give to us? It's a good question. And the more I think about it, do we, again, do we really ever possess what it is that God gives? It's an important thought to remember as we talk about vision and, and a preferred future. Most people think of vision as another hill that we're going to climb, what we're going to do next. That's important. But truthfully, it's an incomplete vision. It's like uh, going to the Christian bookstore when those were places you could actually go to and buying the next Bible study by Beth Moore or Adam Hamilton, thinking that it's going to have all the answers to all of the questions. It's going to set us up for a holy life forever. The truth is, 
sitting at a buffet of Bible studies like that can give you a lot of information, but not change you in the least. So I know people who read the Bible through every year, and they're still some of the nastiest self-entitled critics on the planet. Knowledge of God is it's huge, but it doesn't make you holy. It doesn't give us license to not grow in our knowledge of God, for sure. Saying yes to Jesus is a lifetime journey of knowing. To not do so would be like to eat a meal on Sunday afternoon and then skip food the rest of the week because you got your fix right there, that meal. Once a week discipleship, like a once a week meal, would be anorexic. It's an anorexic faith. Gorging ourselves on an endless buffet line of Christian information. No outflow, no exercise. It's just as bad. It's a discipleship that has no real future or no destination. Discipleship, we know, is about being with Jesus, being transformed in increasing measures by Jesus, and then living like Jesus for those that we are surrounded by. And the end goal is something that we pray every Sunday. We did it a few minutes ago. That his kingdom would be on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we've talked about the mission of Southern Hills, building true reflections of God's amazing love. But on its own, it's not enough. We've talked about our story. How from the earliest days, Southern Hills has committed itself to making a difference in Lexington. 61 years. We've talked about how grace has been a meaningful idea and a word that, that we use to anticipate being a place where, where people are loved with this love of Jesus. We, we talked about teams that help advance our mission. But where is it all taking us? Where is it all leading? That's the question of vision. While a mission answers the question, what, what are we about? Vision answers the question of where, where are we headed? A vision is a preferred future that everyone is working towards. You know, there are micro visions, like uh, what we're doing to make it through this virus. There are long-term visions, like getting a building project finished. But there's also a vision that is supposed to capture all of these things, something that gives focus to all of the micro next steps that we want to take. The vision is really an infinite game that drives everything we do. It will outlive us. We have a vision, a preferred future at Southern Hills. And when folks ask what it is that we're shooting for, what it is that we are basing all of our decisions today on, I say, well, we want to be a hub of Christian living that reflects the transformative light of Jesus Christ. Now, if that sounds like churchy business talk, hold on to your seats because those 12 words paint a picture that I think rivals Van Gogh and Rembrandt and Da Vinci, if we'll let it. When you want to go on vacation, have you ever packed your bags, driven to the airport, checked through security, went to the terminal, sat down and said, ah, last time here, vacation, I have arrived right here in the terminal. Of course not. Airports are never our destination. They are what we use to get where we want to be. Airports are hubs, places where people go and are prepared so that they can ultimately get somewhere else. Well, think about a wheel. And the center of a wheel is a hub where, where spokes are, are sent out. That hub balances the energy as the wheel supports and turns. A, a hub isn't the point, but it does support what the wheel is doing. And a church that sees itself as a hub knows that we are not the destination. We are a place of refreshing and, and training and rejoicing and deepening, but ultimately being sent back out. And our vision says that we're a central place, a core of Christian living, decidedly Christian in all we do, boldly proclaiming a faith that even the apostles said was foolishness to the world around us. Our hub doesn't take its cues from a broken society, but from over 2,000 years of a story that continues to get told. And, and this hub of Christian living, it reflects it. It emanates an energy into the world. The world has to be different because of this emanating, almost radioactive light of Jesus Christ. I read a lot this week about light, and, and here's what I learned. Light affects everything, every aspect of life. The right light can change a moment, a day, your whole attitude. I am solar powered to the T. I need sunlight or I get grumpy. As I sit here today, the sun is shining brilliantly. The shaft is coming and getting me even right now. And I can feel the energy that it gives me. We're energized by the transformative light of Jesus. Transformative, of course, means change. It means that we're going to be different. It means that we were once dead, but now we're alive. It means that the 
the places of sin and brokenness in us, can be transformed to reflect Jesus. It means that that's just the way that I am is never a good enough statement for a disciple of Jesus. But I've been this way all my life, preacher. Good news. You're still living and God can still help you be like him. We reflect Jesus. And that means we have the example of how to be in the world. If you can't see Jesus behaving a way in your life, then you don't need to do it either. And you don't need to be held captive to that kind of brokenness. A hub of Christian living that reflects the transformative light of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful idea. What a great picture. It's a preferred future I want to get behind. Don't you? Can't you see our homes and our workplaces and our city? How it would be different each, each and every one of us started a day with that in mind? Of course, the opposite is equally true. Can you imagine what would happen if we didn't? We'd probably be irre irrelevant. We'd probably be tired. We wouldn't take risks. We'd be isolated. We'd probably be divisive. We might even look for our answers to politicians or parties or maybe even our sports teams. Church, beloved of God the Father, those of us redeemed by the blood of Jesus, disciples, Lexington needs us, needs you and me. The stakes are high. None of the distractions or the quick fixes of our society is going to bring the hope that Jesus can, that his church on mission can. Lexington needs a church that sees a tomorrow of Jesus reflecting into all of the dark corners of the world. It doesn't need a church that, that can't see past right now. Can you see it? Can you see a tomorrow where what is killing us today is itself dead and past? Can you see a city filled with peace, with wholeness, with hope? Can you see our families re renewed? Can you see us recapture the early church's understanding of family, not nuclear, but of singles and marrieds and children and youth and college students and widows and grandparents, all of us claiming one another as a family? You know, Moses worked hard to enter, but ultimately a choice of incredible pride, short-sighted moment, kept him, kept him from entering in. The despair he must have felt, I can only think of as unimaginable. But God was gracious to Moses. He showed him what he longed for. And then he gave Moses the ability to pass on that vision to Joshua. God's vision was something given. God's vision has been given to us here at Southern Hills. But is it something we are, we, we are equally tasked to not just hold on to? We, no, we got to give it away. And in order to pass it on, we have to choose to have eyes that see and a focus that refuses to get off track. We need to be captivated by a picture that takes our breath away. So church, the question is, do you want to be breathless with the opportunities of God? I mean, the other option is to stay put, to play church, to stand on a platform that's burning underneath us. Well, as for me and my house, I want to choose the transformation of Jesus. I want to choose to be part of a difference maker and a difference making community. How about you? What do you want to see? What's keeping you from seeing it? Where do you need even some confession and transformation in your life? Where do you need a bigger picture painted for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow that's radioactive with the love of Jesus. What could be different if we did that? I'd like to invite you to close this time and reflect in, in this quick short video and, uh, and be reminded of the love that we've been given and the vision that we've been offered to share.
Friends, thanks for joining us this morning. I pray you have been blessed, maybe challenged a bit, and all of us having experienced the freedom and excitement of a vision given to all of us, each and every one of us. We're not going to be outside this afternoon for offering. So as you're able, I invite you to continue to give your offerings online or via good old USPS. Thanks for your generosity, your ongoing support of your church. Uh, we will not be having Jeet yet this evening, but Stephen Ministry Training will continue. We'll do it all online. Finally, and once again, let me say thank you. I'm so proud to be your pastor, to know that we're joined in a vision like this together. So I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get up, ready to get after it. Let's be that hub of Christian living that reflects the transformative light of Jesus Christ. And until we gather again, may the love of the Father, the grace of our Savior Jesus the Christ, and the power of Holy Spirit be in you, go with you, and be shared with everyone you meet. And until we do gather again, grace and peace, friends. Grace and peace.